Thank you for joining us for our webinar today. Um, first, a few um, housekeeping uh, points I want to bring up. Um, we are recording this webinar, and uh, we will be able to send out a link to all registrants after the webinar uh, with the slides. Uh, also, any questions that you have, we ask that you type them into your chat box, and we will be sure to get to them, uh, get to them all, hopefully, by the end of the webinar. We're planning to leave ample time for that. And if you have any questions during the webinar, uh, feel free to also just type those in, any logistical questions, and uh, we'll, we'll try to answer them as, as best as we can throughout. So first, a little bit about the American Council for an Energy Efficient Economy, or ACEEE, for those of you who are not familiar with us. We are a nonprofit organization. We're based in DC. And we focus on advancing energy efficiency in the United States uh, through research, uh, policy, and technical assistance uh, to governments and community organizations. We work on research that focuses primarily on end use energy efficiency and also on advancing policy on multiple levels. So here are our webinar presenters for today. First, we will have Sarah Hayes, who is a senior manager and researcher uh, for the Air and Climate Policy team at ACEEE. She's going to uh, give an overview um, about the opportunity uh, in the Clean Power Plan, and particularly the opportunity for low-income communities. After Sarah's finished with her presentation, we'll hear from Lauren Ross, who's our manager for our local policy team here at ACEEE. And she's going to talk a little bit further about you know, who can take advantage um, of this, this big opportunity that exists in this EPA regulation, and, and then what steps uh, do communities need to take to move forward uh, with taking action. So now I'm going to turn things over to Sarah. Can you hear me OK? <clears throat> yes, we can hear you. OK, great. So. Um, um, I'll just start out by apologizing to everyone on the call because you're going to see a couple of slides here with a ton of text. Um, I promise the whole presentation isn't like this, but uh, we thought that since the slides are going to be available to participants after the call, that um, it would be helpful perhaps to have this explanation written down in one place. So I'll go over it quickly, um, and hopefully it will be useful to you um, in the future after the webinar. But um, just to give a little bit of background and context so that we're all talking about the same thing, um, the, the Environmental Protection Agency is using a section of the Clean Air Act called 111D to regulate carbon dioxide emissions from the existing power sector, um, specifically uh, the fossil fuel plants in the existing power sector. And um, <clears throat> the Clean Power Plan is the final rule that EPA has has released, have published, um, in order to regulate the, the, pollutant, the, the CO2 pollution from those um, generators. Right now, uh, that rule has been finalized, but they're taking comments on some additional documents that they released. And uh, the comment period ends in January, but um, uh, the additional documents include things like a model rule for states, because the states will ultimately be the ones that have to um, develop a compliance plan that shows how they're going to achieve a 2030 emissions goal that EPA set out for them. Um, EPA proposed the rule. It, uh, it was revised. It's now final. And now we're, take, we're submitting comments on these other documents. So I said the model rule. There's also the final rule, uh, the federal plan, which is what happens if a state doesn't submit a plan. Uh, then EPA comes in and, and makes a plan for them. That's a federal plan. Um, there's also some additional technical support documents. Um, there's a guidance document on evaluation, measurement, and verification of energy efficiency, which is kind of how you count it and how much it counts for. Um, so. There's a whole bunch of stuff that people are learning right now and trying to understand and digest. And uh, we've got a little bit more time to figure out what we want to say to uh, EPA and submit comments. The focus, the aspect that we're focusing on today is a program that EPA put into the final rule uh, called Clean Energy Incentive Program. 
but what we want to emphasize is that while this program creates a very clear opportunity for low-income um, investments in energy efficiency, there are also other opportunities under this rulemaking um, to incentivize and um, encourage investments in low-income communities, and we'll be talking about that as well. Uh, could we do the next slide, please? Um, <clears throat> uh, just a quick note about timing. Um, I mentioned that we the deadline for comments is January. Um, EPA has said states must submit a final plan in September 2016. Except for that, um, if a state wants an extension, they can get an extension until 2018, and it looks like the bar for getting that extension is going to be pretty low. And we're hearing that a lot of states are anticipating asking for that extension, which means that between now and September 2016, um, there are a few key decisions that states need to make because they do have to make a, a submission to EPA saying kind of what the general direction is they're heading. And if they want to participate in the CEIP program, so the early program for crediting investments in low-income energy efficiency, then uh, they must say so um, at, at the 2016 deadline. Um, but yeah, I think I've covered all this. Can we do the next slide, please? So um, that hopefully is it for the text-heavy slides. And now we're going to just move into giving you some additional details about what the low-income opportunity is in the Clean Power Plan. Um, and who can take advantage of the opportunity, as well as what do you need to do to make sure that um, the opportunity can be realized. Next slide, please. So what is the opportunity? I first should caveat this thing. This is, this is what we call back of envelope uh, calculation. But I wanted to get some sense of how much this opportunity might actually be in terms of money for low-income communities or investment in dollars. So the Clean Energy Incentive Program, CEIP, is the program that EPA has created that says if you invest in low-income energy efficiency or renewables before the program starts, so in, in an early investment, then uh, we're going to give you some additional incentive in the, in the form of an allowance or a credit to reward that behavior. So EPA has set aside the equivalent of 300 million tons from the program that they're going to give away uh, to reward these types of investments. So I've said, well, let's say half of the allowances go to energy efficiency. I mean, that's a major, major guess. Who knows um, which industries and which players will decide to participate in this program and act early. But Let's say about half of it goes to energy efficiency in low-income communities. Um, and EPA has said, for those event investments in the low-income communities, we're going we're gonna to double what we give you. We're going to give you extra credit. So you take the $300 million, you cut it in half, but then you double it right back because EPA is doubling it. And if we say allowances are worth $4 a ton, which again, who knows, but I feel like that's a fairly conservative guess then that's $1.2 billion of investment in low-income communities in the, two -year program, in the two years that this program uh, would be operational. And as I said before, outside of the CEIP, there are other option opportunities to encourage investment in low-income communities all the way through 2030, which is the um, final compliance date for the Clean Power Plan. Next slide, please. So how does this work? Um, the CEIP, the Early Action Program, is for activities that take place in 2020 and 2021. EPA is going, as I said, going to match investments by awarding allowances or emission rate credits. So if you're in a state that, that opts to take a mass-based target, so you're, you have a tonnage cap, then the uh, commodity that would be tradable is an allowance. If you're in a state that opts for a rate-based target, which is pounds per megawatt hour, then your tradable commodity is an emissions rate credit or an ERC. 
So whichever one you are operating in, your, your state would um, be getting from EPA the equivalent or the, the appropriate allowance or credit from the federal pool based on the investments and the energy savings that qualify. Now, other allocations from states are possible. So this is just a model rule and a model program that EPA has put out. States can opt to do something more. They can opt not to participate at all. They could say, we like this doubling um, that EPA is doing, but in fact, we really want to encourage low-income investments, so we're going to take, we're going to borrow from our cap a set aside, and we're going to give even more for those early investments. Or they're going to, they could say, we're going to extend the program so that clean energy, um, that investments in clean energy in low-income communities get awarded double allowances all the way through 2030. Um, it's very flexible. There's lots of options for states, and I think that just um, uh, bellies the importance of getting involved in the state planning process to um, advocate for what it is that you want because um, I think there's a lot of stakeholders at the table talking about efficiency and clean air planning that maybe haven't, haven't participated in the past or have not been involved in the same way in past um, rulemaking. So I think it's important to um, step up and, and make sure you can have an opportunity to participate. Uh, the 2022 to 2030 is the official compliance period for the Clean Power Plan. And uh, as I mentioned, I, I think I already walked through basically some, some um, ideas or some examples of how states could incentivize investments in low-income communities through that compliance period. Um, yeah, I think I, I've said enough there. Next slide, please. So who, who are the people who could benefit? I keep vaguely talking about low-income communities. Um, well, under the CEIP, EPA is taking comment on what is the definition of low income. And right now, there's a whole bunch of discussion happening. Um, should this be a geographic definition based on regions um, or localities? Is it something that should be defined based on the income of the individual or the household? Um, there are lots of existing definitions under existing federal and state programs. Are those things that we should be looking to, or do we need an uh, entirely new definition for purposes of CEIP? So because this question is currently not answered, it is an opportunity to give a lot of feedback, um, but we, it also means we don't know what restrictions there might be on the types of individuals, programs, projects, buildings, regions that might participate in EPA's um, program. So if a state were going to consider something beyond EPA's proposed program, oh, I think this, there we go, um, then uh, states can uh, incentivize low-income investments in their individual plans, as I said, by borrowing from the future and um, allocating uh, tons for those investments or having a set aside of some kind or basically setting up something in their allocation methodology so that low income projects um, are rewarded. Um, and the who and the how much is totally at the state's discretion. So um, I think I've covered all that I want to say for now. I'm available for questions both now and at the end, but um, I'm going to just turn it back to Cassandra. Great. Thanks, Sarah. We do have one question that would probably be good to answer now coming through the line. Uh, the question is, so do states entirely lose the opportunity to use the CEIP if they do not affirmatively say they wish to use it um, by September 2016, or rather uh, if they do not say in their initial submittal, whether that be a, a request for extension in 2016 or a final plan? Um, do they lose that opportunity? Um, I believe that's the idea, and um, I just I'm only hesitating from giving you a really firm answer because I think there's a lot that's in flux about the CEIP. Um, one of the issues that people are commenting a lot on is that two years is not enough time to really make investments and ramp up at any kind of large scale. So. Um, 
there are requests to start it earlier or extend it in some way um, over a longer period of time. So uh, basically, I just think that, um, yes, that's what, it, what EPA has intended for now, but I think it might change. All right, thank you. And just a reminder to everyone to keep typing in your questions, and we will get to the remaining questions and any others you may have after Lauren's presentation. So now I will turn things over to Lauren Roth to continue on. Great. Thanks, Sarah, and thank you all for joining today. I think we have a pretty diverse audience on the phone, but regardless, many of you are probably asking what types of projects could count and what types of projects can you or should you be advocating for. Um, but before I get to that, I want to just take a minute and revisit why we're advocating for these programs during the state planning processes um, and why it's so important and um, the unique opportunity that Clean Power Plan provides. Specifically, Capturing energy efficiency investments for low-income households and communities in state compliance plans or within this uh, Clean Energy Incentive Program has the potential to lead to additional financial support for utility-led programs that reach low-income groups, create a permanence of, for programs, either utility or non-utility programs, we'll get to that point in a second, improve existing programs by increasing rigor and oversight, also generate momentum for new projects and programs. And as I have here, bolded on the slide, it's certainly a unique opportunity to link low-income energy efficiency to broader state goals, such as economic development, public health, job creation, and environmental issues. In this slide, I provide a non-conclusive list of programs and pro projects that are likely to count under the Clean Energy Incentive Program or the Clean Power Plan. There's a lot here, um, so let me walk through it. Um, I start with utility-sponsored programs. These are energy efficiency programs that are supported by ratepayer funds that are collected as a tariff or surcharge on customers' bills. Currently, they represent the largest single source of money that states use or direct to be used for energy efficiency programs. Many utilities develop and run these programs in response to energy savings goals set by the state and as a critical part of their demand side management. I'll elaborate a little bit more for I'll uh, elaborate a little bit more on the potential for ratepayer or utility programs in a few minutes, but right now I'll kind of walk through this list. I also list cost-sharing partnerships. This refers to a collaborative way in which utility programs can be aligned with other state-level programs to increase energy efficiency investments and improve delivery in low-income households. For example, government agencies, nonprofits, and utilities offer a wide range of energy efficiency programs that serve the sector. Too often, these services are delivered independently and without a high level of coordination. This can result in duplication of, of programs or of efforts, wasted resources, and poor delivery. However, in some cases, energy efficiency and energy assistance programs targeted at low-income households can be or are being coordinated. Some examples include state-level programs that align several different program funds, um, some states have a nonprofit entity that coordinates energy assistance and energy efficiency throughout the state. And of course, utility programs can be designed in such a way to coordinate um, assistance as well. I'll also return to some examples of this in a few minutes. Thirdly, outside of the utility space, there are additional ways states can deliver energy efficiency, particularly in the low-income sector. For example, Several housing finance agencies, when deciding where to, where to allocate low-income housing tax credits, require or give preference to projects that result in energy efficiency for affordable housing. State housing trust funds can also be, can be an additional vehicle for doing so, similar to housing finance agencies. There's also a history of city and state administered community development block grants um, that are being allocated to reduce energy use in low-income communities. So these are just some examples in which existing state-administered funds or programs can be designed to achieve energy savings in the sector. And lastly, I want to mention Energy Savings Performance Contracts, or ESPCs, um, for this webinar. And these can be, and traditionally, um, ESPCs are a vehicle for delivering energy efficiency investments in low-income communities. Um, they typically allow federal agencies to procure energy savings and um, facilitate uh, improvements with no upfront cost. 
Um, this is done by forming a partnership between a federal agency and an energy service company. Essentially, um, this partnership allows it so that uh, the agency or even some private companies can pay for energy savings, energy saving measures or retrofits um, through actual future savings. So increasing, increasingly, this model, with support from the Department of um, Housing, the U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development, is being adopted by state chartered public housing agencies. For example, and I, I just, you know, some of you, if you're not familiar with public housing agencies, they usually administer government assistance for housing, and many of them house some of the most vulnerable, um, vulnerable populations throughout the country. So, for example, the New York Housing Authority. Um, commonly referred to as NYCHA, is in the process of implementing the largest energy savings program for any public housing authority in the country. For this project, it is estimated that at least $100 million in work will occur across 300 NYCHA developments to upgrade and, and retrofit thousands of buildings. This will dramatically reduce greenhouse gas emissions and generate tens of millions of dollars in cost savings, as well as creating more than 500 jobs. So these are kind of a, a list, and I'm going to walk through some of these examples, um, but I'm happy to elaborate more in Q&A. So in this, this slide, I'd like to give an example of um, the level of utility spending currently going to energy efficiency programs that serve low-income customers. I borrow these numbers from the Midwest Energy Efficiency Alliance to provide a snapshot of 2014 spending in the Midwest. I should note that this is utility spending for a handful of cities, um, a handful of states in the Midwest. Um, uh, sorry, it's it's utility spending um, based at the utility level here. And I should note that the states that I chose have robust programs in spending. This is not the case for every or most states. The electric programs in this table, for instance, show on average a $2.5 million investment per utility in the low-income sector. I include gas programs in this table for reference, but gas will not count, gas savings and gas spending will not count towards compliance of Clean Power Plan, and this is a point I'll return to a bit later. But the point here is to show the level of funding from utilities to support low-income efficiency. It's quite sizable. Um, next. And now in this slide, I show a little bit different from the previous slide where we're looking at actual spending that's going into the sector. In this slide, I show the, what the potential is for investments in the affordable multifamily building sector to help states meet their compliance targets. And here I just have a handful of states. Um, this chart published by the group Energy Efficiency for All gives estimates of potential carbon carbon savings by gigawatt hours from investing in energy efficiency in affordable multifamily buildings. The final column is what, what I want to point out here, and it gives a percent of a state's carbon reduction target that could be met through energy efficiency in affordable multifamily housing. For example, in states such as Georgia, Virginia, Maryland, and New York, anywhere from 6 to 11 percent of the carbon reduction target could be met through such investment. Okay, in this slide, this is where I'd like to return to the topic of cost sharing and collaboration among low-income programs. Now, in a bit, we're going to get to stakeholder, state, stakeholder engagement, and, um, but I think that walking through some of these programs helps inform, hopefully, um, what you all will be advocating for in the end. But as we think of improving or expanding utility programs that serve the low-income sector, it's important that pro program managers not recreate the wheel. And by this, I mean low-income customers have already been identified and already received services from other organizations. By leveraging those existing relationships, energy efficiency programs can decrease their administrative costs and may increase accessibility and trust among the customers. For example, in some states, the weatherization assistance program does not include electric efficiency measures, such as for appliances and lighting. Utilities can provide the funds to use in, conjunc in conjunction with weatherization funds to include electric savings measures alongside the weatherization service delivery for a seamless program delivery. And I'm going to walk through that example in a bit. But this is an especially um, relevant approach under the Clean Power Plan as electric savings are what count. Um, but one example of this in practice is in Vermont. 
where Efficiency Vermont supplements the state weatherization program with add-on measures, those that go beyond what would otherwise be included in the state and federally funded WAP program. These measures include Energy Star qualified refrigerators and clothes washers, um, lighting, ventilation fans, and smart power strips. These add-on measures are offered as part of the program delivery as, as WAP through community action agencies. So customers only need to inter interact with one program, which creates a more comprehensive program delivery that addresses a broader range of low-income customer needs. In 2011, Efficiency Vermont's WAC add-on program served 1,500 households. In Ohio, there's also a state-level synergy for the provision of whole health services. To do a comprehensive job, they basically combine federal and state WAP funding, utility funds, home repair and housing rehabilitation dollars, and any other money they can find. Some states coordinate with utilities to serve low-income customers, which is the case in Massachusetts. Massachusetts policies require coordination among multiple agencies serving low-income households on a statewide level. With um, coordination through the Massachusetts, Massachusetts Low Income Energy Affordab Affordability Network, LEAN. The network works to standard, standardize eligibility requirements and procedures for standard program and implementation in community action agencies throughout the state. Um, in doing so, they act as a one-stop shop for customers to, to, to acknowledge their eligibility for energy efficiency programs and to move forward with such programs. Another point I want to return to is the coordination of rate assistance and energy efficiency programs. This is common in some states where rate assistance and energy efficiency programs are more regularly coordinated and they share customer information. One example of this, of this is in California, where the highest user, users in California's rate assistance program are identified, notified of their high usage, and provided resources on their utilities, on their utilities, utilities energy efficiency programs. This is in, in addition to receiving a discount of 30 to 35 percent on their electric and natural gas bills. In order for customers to remain enrolled in the rate assistance program, they must lower their usage and participate in local energy efficiency programs. So moving on, um, those were basically what we consider as some of the best approaches to low-income efficiency. Again, that wasn't necessarily the whole focus of today's webinar, but I'm happy to go into that um, in more detail in Q&A. And ACEEE will also, in the early um, or the late fall, early winter, will be releasing a report on best practices for utility-led low-income efficiency. So be sure to look out for that. But now moving on to some additional considerations. And here I list some of the frequent questions we've been hearing. I should say some of them are still open for debate during EPA's comment period, so we don't have all the answers. The first is the issue of what types of projects or programs can count under the Clean Energy Incentive Program and the Clean Power Plan. This is still open for comment, but EPA has given indication that types of projects eligible for credit under the CEIP will be flexible and, in li and likely include residential, municipal, school, and industrial programs. A more expanded list and one without income restriction will count under long-term compliance planning. And that goes back to the point we made earlier about um, thinking both in terms of short-term clean energy incentive program and long-term compliance planning. In terms of whether existing programs can count, this differs among both um, approaches. For credit under the clean energy incentive program, programs must start after a state submits a final plan, which is right now by 2018, and achieve savings in 2021 and 2022, and of course follow the guidelines for eligible projects. For long-term um, clean power plan planning, programs that were implemented since 2013 and are still achieving savings in 2022 onward can count. Okay, we also received questions about whether gas savings will count. This is um, especially a pertinent question for weatherization providers. But according to the final rule, only end-use energy efficiency that produces electric savings at the power plant will count, and thus not gas savings. And lastly, on to the issue of weatherization. Um, several asking whether or not federal, state, or, late, or local, or utility weatherization um, funding can count towards compliance. Um, this is still unclear and up for comment. 
So again, it stresses the need here um, to be active during the comment period if you feel strongly about any of this, um, any of these topics, and there's still a handful of other topics. Um, Sarah mentioned a few, and I'll mention a few in a bit that are still open for comment. Um, but remember um, the distinction between the short-term short planning for participation in the Clean Energy Incentive Program and the longer-term planning um, under Clean Power Plan compliance. So now more on to the topic of stakeholder engagement. As we've said a few times now, there's lots of opportunity, but no guarantees that any of this money will flow to low-income communities. Stakeholder engagement is critical. Moving forward, states need to single a, a non-binding intent to participate in the Clean Energy Incentive Program by September 2016. You can work with states to develop compliance plans um, that incentivize and reward energy efficiency investments in low-income communities. Stakeholders must engage in both state and have opportunities to engage in both the state and federal planning processes. Um, tell EPA what you need to, to um, what you need to make this, the Clean Energy Incentive Program work. This may include commenting to EPA on the definition of low income, the allocation amounts, types of projects and programs that are eligible, and the timing. Also, ask your state to participate in the program. This in, this includes a, um, a wider audience than you may think, both the governor, state, le le state legislature, air office, energy and environment office, these are all, um, all the groups that you should be talking to. And lastly, engage in compliance plan development in your state. Help your regulators understand options to incentivize and reward low-income investments throughout compliance beyond just the Clean Energy Incentive Program participation, and that speaks back to some of the best practice um, elements of programs I just mentioned. And finally, um, it's important you all have a seat at the table during stakeholder engagement and ensure that, um, actually, I'm going to move on to the next slide. I kind of covered this already. OK, again, this is a, a slide with a lot of text, but I hope that it will be a resource to you after this webinar as well. Um, so I've mentioned now that it's important you all have a seat at the table during stakeholder engagement and ensure that low income efficiency, whether it's driven by utilities or not, is an end use efficiency strategy under the Clean Power Plan. Um, and I had mentioned the different groups involved, governors, air offices, energy offices. Um, now traditionally in this space we would maybe just be speaking to utilities or those that regulate them, but now it's a much wider audience and therefore there's a lot of questions or preparation you can do to make your case for low income efficiency when engaging with these um, other offices. And here I provide a whole list of questions just to name a few. Um, what energy efficiency programs that serve the low income and multifamily sectors exist in your state? If none, what utilities are poised to deliver such programs? Um, you could also look at what policies support or could support the development and expansion of efficiency programs or projects that serve low income communities. So kind of doing a historical analysis of what's been done in your state, what savings have been achieved. If there aren't best practices being done in your state, pull from other examples. Um, and we at ACEAAA will hopefully be able to help you do that um, as you all are planning to um, engage more with stakeholders in your state and during the comment period for EPA. And my last point that I'll end with is don't go in this alone. Um, building local par partnerships is equally as important for advocating around the Clean Power Plan and more generally for developing programs. Um, these partnerships can include electric, gas, and water utilities, building owners and property management companies, those providing affordable housing, contractors, housing advocates and intermediaries like Enterprise and LISC, financial institutions, and housing finance agencies. These partners will help provide an understanding of the unique characteristics of the um, low-income and multifamily markets and create a broader coalition to advocate for investments in these sectors under compliance plans. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much, Lauren and Sarah. Um, as, you, as you all can tell, there's a lot of information. Um, so um, Lauren and Sarah really tried to give you um, as, as much information as possible while still being concise on the issue. And I know we have a lot of questions coming through the line, um, so we'll try to address all of them. 
Um, keep putting those through. In the meantime, um, this slide shows you a, a series of resources. We will make these slides available, so you'll be able to uh, connect to those links on your own. And I'll leave this contact slide up uh, as we mention in the next uh, 20 minutes or so. Um, as I said, we, we did have a lot of questions come through the line, so I'll ask uh, both Sarah and Lauren to, to hopefully you know, be as thorough as possible, but also to be concise so that we can try and get through uh, most, if not all, of these in the time that we have left. So I'll start uh, this, this uh, first question. I'm kind of combining a few, um, and I'll kick it over to Sarah. Um, so the question we had was, um, you know, assuming that a state uses a math-based approach, um, does ACEEE have or, you know, have any other organizations um, thought through um, about how many tons of CO2 um, each uh, saved megawatt hour? Um, you know, a saved megawatt hour through energy efficiency projects would be worth. Is there is there a way to quantify this value um, up front, or do you know studies on that? And then also um, as a follow on to that, um, in order to participate in the clean energy incentive program, is the state required to um, set aside uh, a certain amount of allowances from their budget? during the compliance period, given that this is something that happens before compliance, do they actually take from their budget during compliance and apply it uh, toward projects in that 2020 to 2021 time frame? Um, I, I can remember the first question and answer it, but I might need you to repeat the second question by the time I'm done. Uh, okay. <laughs> the, um, the first question about um, how would you convert kilowatt hour or megawatt hours of savings from a program into tons of, of, of uh, allowances in a math-based program? Um, the, I guess the first answer is that's up to states to decide how they want to do that. Um, and I think that most likely that, well, one of the likely ways that would happen is in deciding how to allocate allowances, a state might um, decide to do a set aside, or it might decide instead it's going to auction its allowances, and then it would fund energy efficiency through the funds uh, that are received from that auction, in which case there wouldn't need to be um, a conversion into a ton. Um, so I think that the allocation methodology that states develop will inform that quite a bit. But I would also direct people to look at um, some of the EPA documentation that was released, which um, takes the rate base, the pounds per megawatt hour target, and uh, converts it into a ton cap for states. So um, there's quite a bit of guidance in the EPA documentation about how to do that and um, some detail about uh, how you would um, measure and quantify the energy savings from projects, all of these are steps that um, you would need to consider if you were trying to take energy savings and convert them into tons. If you just want a tool to be able to do that, just to get a quick answer, um, you can look at our super calculator, the State Utility Pollution Reduction Calculator, and pick um, an energy savings um, measure that is um, akin to something you're thinking of, and it will tell you what the emissions impact will be for CO2, NOx, and SOx. Um, there's also a great tool that EPA produced called AVERT, which um, takes some time to learn, but um, is a pretty um, cool free tool for entering energy savings and getting um, emissions impact. And what was the second question? Okay, great, thank you. Um, so, and, and just to get it to the value of, of those allowances and what they'll be in, in the market, that is something that will be determined at the market level once those allowances get, get going and get traded. Is that, is that accurate to say? Are you asking about the dollar value? Yes. Oh, um, yeah, I'm sorry. I thought you were asking about how to convert um, megawatt hours into tons. Yeah, the dollar value, it, that, so I put that $4 up there. I, I picked that based on um, 
a very round estimate of one point at which Reggie allowances were trading. But um, I think uh, probably the, the completest analysis is in the EPA rulemaking. They talk about um, how much it will cost to control um, pollution in order to meet the goals. And it varies considerably depending on um, what compliance mechanisms you use. So if you're going to build a new gas plant, instead of doing energy efficiency, it's going to cost a lot more. Um, and that will affect the price of allowances. OK, great. And then uh, so the, the, the follow-on question just had to do with the actual process for where these allowances, um, in particular allowances, are, are coming from in order to um, put them toward projects uh, for participating in this clean energy incentive program in 2020 and 2021. So the question is, do you take allowances from your budget of, of uh, during the compliance period after you know 2022 and beyond? Do you take allowances and apply them to uh, projects um, in that early action period um, in addition to those federal uh, you know, matching uh, allowances that you would receive. Yes. OK, very concise. Thank you. Um, so the next question I will put to Lauren. It has to do with additional resources. Um, will ACCEE be producing a clean power plan matrix or something of the sort um, uh, that details state energy efficiency programs and low income programs? Sure. Um, so first I'll say that we do um, keep a state and local database of, um, we have a state and local policy database which does include some more kind of high level estimates of utility spending by state and locality. Um, we don't go into too much detail in terms of actual program design and delivery mechanisms, but we do have a lot of resources on different types of efficiency programs. So um, be sure to Check out AC Triple AC just our historical work on um, best program practices for efficiency. And feel free to reach out if there's a particular type of program, whether it's one that um, focuses on buildings or industry or even transportation. Um, you know, if there's any types of best practices and efficiency you're looking for, we can provide you with that. But in this context, in Clean Power Plan, we are um, somewhat close to releasing a I don't want to say too close, maybe a few months out from releasing a report on best practices for utility-led low-income efficiency programs. Now, in this paper, we will also touch on state-level coordination, as I referred to earlier. So looking at how utility programs are leveraging other social service agencies that are providing a um, variety of social services to low-income households, households, also utility programs that coordinate with weatherization providers throughout the state. So we will be talking about utility collaboration in that paper. Um, but this, this will, I think, probably the most useful paper in the context of Clean Power Plan. Um, but in the coming year, we'll be, we will be releasing several sources on, um, on ways in which low-income energy efficiency, efficiency in affordable multifamily buildings can be included in state's compliance plans. So that will be some template language and model programs. So that's all to say. Um, Keep an eye on what we're releasing. And if you have a particular question, be sure to reach out to me. And I can direct you to the um, correct sources. OK. Thank you, Lauren. Next question um, has to do with the Clean Energy Incentive Program and the particulars around that program. Um, uh, this is to you, Sarah. Um, on one of your slides, you had indicated that um, the program will have a 300 million uh, short ton of, of allowances slash emission rate credit as a federal match. Um, but since EPA gives double credit, um, so a two-for-one match uh, uh, or two-for-one credit for efficiency and a one-to-one -one credit for renewable energy within that program, um, can that federal set-aside actually increase from that 300 uh, million ton uh, that it's at right now? Or is it fixed at that total? Is that something that will that can be commented on? So um, I think there's a couple issues in that question. One is is the 300 million tons set, and um, it is in the final rule. So um, 
that would typically indicate that it is not open for comment, though there are many aspects of CEIP that EPA is welcoming comments on. So if you feel strongly that the pool should be a different number, um, I, I don't think there's necessarily a harm in suggesting that. Um, the other piece of the, the question that I hear is, um, could it be more? Could we be talking, you know, so I, I did that calculation, it came to 1.2 billion, could it actually be more? Yes, it could be significantly more. Um, I was just calculating the value of EPA's pool, and as we discussed, states could be um, allocating um, in all kinds of ways for early action, and that could significantly increase the um, investment potential for low-income projects and programs. Great, thank you. This next one, um, I might put it to Lauren first, um, or answer, you know, whomever wants to really answer this. It has to do with the types of programs um, that can count for compliance. So the question is, is coordination of these programs, these efficiency programs, through one particular state agency required to qualify as a program that can be used for compliance, or or can you use other types of things that don't have to be either coordinated with an agency or get approved by an agency? I know, I know Lauren, you, you described a, a series of different types of programs. Maybe you, you can expand on that a little bit. Sure. So I would say that, and, and Sarah, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but I, it isn't required. The, the reason I'm focusing um, on these kind of collaborative or coordinated approaches within within this today's webinar is because um, where possible cost sharing can be particularly important for low-income efficiency programs. Um, low-income housing often needs repairs um, before energy efficiency measures can even take place and um, you know for, for that reason and for other reasons similar um, where you can draw partnerships or or you know other agencies working inside these households to incorporate energy efficiency um, makes the most sense. So cost sharing is particularly important and, and alignment is particularly important when it comes to low income efficiency. Um, but that's why I've been focusing it on today's webinar and I don't think that it's a requirement. Sarah? No, you're absolutely right. It's not and um, I, I think though one question that underlies that is um, if you're not part of an agency and you're not a utility, how do we make sure that this pool is available to you as an energy efficiency provider? How do we make sure that the financial incentive gets into the right hands? And I think that um, we have yet to see how that's going to work, particularly in the mass-based context. Okay, great. Thank you. Okay, so the next question we have has to do with um, federal uh, programs. So, uh, you know, Lauren had touched upon um, uh, the WAP program um, a little bit, and this question gets a little bit further at that. Um, you know, can savings come from federal WAP to count toward clean energy incentive program? And I'll expand that question even further. Um, not just the Clean Energy Incentive Program in the two years before 2022, but could it count throughout um, compliance? Because that's the other the other piece of this is you know low income can be used throughout compliance, not just that that time frame. Um, and uh, you know, uh, along with that question, it has to do with state administration of uh, weatherization programs versus federal administration and and are there um, you know, any sort of restrictions on that or requirements on that as far as being able to use savings from those uh, programs to count toward compliance? Um, thanks, Cassandra. So I, as I mentioned earlier, this point um, has been coming up a lot, and it's still very much open um, under comment for EPA. Um, but there's a few issues going on. One is whether federal funds can then be used um, can be count federal investments in energy efficiency that um, rely on federal funds can they be counted towards credit under um, the CEIP or Clean Power Plan. Um, so while that's 
still open whether federal funds and then it comes down to what can state and local funds, I think that's still a discussion that needs to needs to play out. But I, I think one point is, uh, and um, one point to emphasize, and I did some of that through the webinar today, but is that existing channels um, that maybe federal weatherization funds are, are applied should be um, seen as a useful mechanism for increasing investments in the sector. Um, so whether it is coordination with more utility spending, um, again, whether or not federal funding weatherization can count is still a, is up for debate, but there's no reason to suggest that program, additional programs or services can't be attached to those existing channels. Um, you know, that's a, a lot what the low-income sector knows. It's worked. Um, and there's no reason not to build on that success. Okay, great, thank you. The um, let's see, the next question we have um, is in relation to a slide. Uh, so I'm going to go back to that slide, and it was this one. Um, the question is: Are the savings um, percentages from the draft or final goals in this table? Um, and uh, because it's talking about building block four. And I think um, I'll, I'll kick this over to Sarah um, to kind of talk about what what was building block four and then just in general what these, this column on the far right side means, what, what percentage this uh, is of a total state goal or, or what have you. So I'll kick that to Sarah. Um, sure. So uh, I don't know if this is happening to everyone, but my screen is frozen on the thank you, and it's just thinking about moving to the other um, slide. But I, I recall what you're referring to, and um, the questioner, the observant questioner is correct, that this was an analysis that was done on the draft rule. Um, and I think the reason we put it up there was because there aren't a lot of these analyses, and um, it's illustrative that um, the uh, investments in, I mean, we're trying to make two big points, I think, in terms of the numbers. One is that there's a lot of potential investment um, that could be directed towards the low-income community. And then on the flip side, there's also a lot of potential for energy savings and emission reductions that can be used for compliance. So there's a nice, um, the, the numbers bear out. There's a good reason for both sides of this equation to be working together, a mutual benefit. Um, and the analysis that's referenced on that slide is the percentage of building block four, which if you followed this before, is the equivalent of a 1.5% energy savings target by 2030. So those percentages in the far right column are um, percent of your, if you were in a state that said, we're going we're gonna to use 1.5% per year savings target for our um, path towards compliance with efficiency, then um, of that target, what's in column four is what you could achieve from the multifamily sector. Okay, thank you very much. The, um, another question that we have coming through is on another one of the slides, which I'm going to go through right now. It's on the additional consideration slide. Um, the question was, can you describe your answer to this first question? Can programs go beyond residential um, and kind of tailor it to you know, in both the, the clean energy incentive programs, can programs that are not residential count? And then just broader compliance, 2022 and beyond, can low-income residential count or anything beyond that? Sure. So um, when clean energy incentive program was first released and, you know, in, in weeks after, there was some confusion or debate whether um, we were talking solely about um, energy efficiency, residential energy efficiency programs in low-income households, or could they be any energy efficiency projects in low-income communities geographically that would result um, in benefits maybe in terms of community development and economic development? Think um, schools, uh, local businesses, um, churches, nonprofits, so on, municipal investments. And so the question there is, um, while EPA is still taking comment on the types of projects that can count under Clean Energy Incentive Program, they've given um, 
pretty strong indication that the types of projects can be flexible, suggesting that they can include um, more than just residential investments in low-income households. Um, so hopefully that, that part is a little bit more clear. And then in terms of longer-term planning or compliance under, um, compliance under the Clean Power Plan, again, here we're just looking at end-use energy efficiency, electric savings at the power plant. So therefore, there's no reason not to think that um, a variety of types of projects way beyond residential, including um, industrial, um, commercial, municipal, and so on, could all count under um, the, the longer-term clean, clean power plant compliance. In addition, they wouldn't face any then restrictions in terms of low-income. Um, that, that, that's a decision that's at the state level. Thank you. And as a follow-on to that, you had just mentioned um, municipal types of programs or projects. Could you give one example of a type of municipal project that could be used? Sure. And I think the most obvious example would be um, upgrades or retrofits to um, municipal-owned buildings throughout a, lo uh, throughout a local community. Okay. Um, it could also be street lighting. Um, programs. But I think those would be two kind of key examples of municipal projects. Great. Thank you. The, um, we're going to get to one or two more questions. Um, then the remaining questions will be sure to follow up with, with people directly. Um, um, one of the que this next question I'm going to put to Sarah, and it has to do with emissions trading. Um, how can, how can low-income communities benefit? from emission trading schemes that will be implemented in the Clean Power Plan. So, so if you could just briefly, you know, describe, you know, what, how do you uh, move from, you know, having an allowance or who does that go to and how does that person benefit from having an allowance? What, what, what happens with um, being able to turn that allowance into money to put toward a project? Sure. So um, the way I'm thinking about it right now is that there are um, two ways that I think are at the top of my list for how we get um, the financial incentive into the uh, hands of the people who do the investments in the low-income project. And um, one, I said earlier, is if you auction the allowances, then you have a big pool of money that you can award in various ways for um, you know, a clean energy of choice, and um, this would be one way to get a, a pool of money to allocate to those types of projects. Um, I think if you um, don't do that, another way is through direct allocation of an allowance. So you do a project, you come in and you say, here's my project and here's my verification that it um, achieved the energy savings I'm saying it achieved and um, please award me my allowance, and you would receive your allowance, and um, you have then some options of, um, you know, if you were going to do the project anyway and you want to reduce the emissions that happen overall in your state, you could retire the allowance and just hold it and never do anything with it. If you're trying to turn it into money, you would need to sell it. Um, and how you sell it is yet to be determined, but there are some options that are very likely to be the case. You could enter into a private deal with somebody. So you approach the utility and say, look, I'm going to have a thousand allowances. I'll sell them to you. Let's agree on a price. And you have a contract. Um, or there might be some kind of marketplace that evolves where you could make your allowances available to the marketplace. Um, I am not yet, I'm not aware of any plans yet for an exchange to be created. There is a registry that is, um, many of you may have heard about, but they're not going to have an exchange function. There are exchanges that already exist that trade emission credits for other programs, futures and, and those sorts of things. And so it's very possible that there could be a contract that starts getting traded on an existing energy exchange. Um, but all of that is yet to be determined. Okay, thank you. Um, the next would be a quick answer for you, Sarah, and then we'll end on one last question. Um, but this quick question, will behavioral-based energy efficiency programs qualify for clean power plant compliance just generally? 
<laughs> That's an easy answer. Um, well, I guess the easy answer is EPA has left a tremendous amount of flexibility uh, in the hands of states to determine um, what kinds of energy efficiency they include in their compliance plans. In a rate-based scenario, there's some pretty specific details about criteria um, that EPA recommends these kinds of projects meet. And um, in a math-based scenario, I, I guess I, I just try to convey one point, which is you already have your cap. Let's say your cap is 100 tons. You can give those allowances out to anybody you want for anything. So if you feel like behavior is absolutely the thing you want to incentivize, you could give all your allowances to a behavior program, even if that program hasn't yet demonstrated performance, because then the market will get the allowances into the hands of people who need it for compliance, and the money will get into the hands of the people that you gave the allowances to. I'm not saying that's what you should do. I think it's important to have some um, good EM&V, good solid verification that the money that's being spent on these programs are actually achieving what is expected. Um, but there are lots of ways that you could incentivize new action or emerging technologies or um, uh, approaches that haven't yet had an, uh, a way to demonstrate what they're achieving. Great, thank you very much. The last question, uh, we since we are very much over time, um, the last question I'll, I'll get to now, but I just want to say to everyone who has not heard their question answered yet, we will follow up with you uh, with answers through email. We have your, your questions here, so don't feel uh, shortchanged, I hope, in any way. Um, but the last question has to do with um, stakeholder uh, engagement. Uh, I know, Lauren, you uh, discussed some ways toward the end of your presentation about how uh, communities and, and organizations and various stakeholders can go about um, engaging, but this is just a, a follow-up question to that. Um, are states convening uh, stakeholder uh, in, engagement meetings? Um, and then uh, in addition to that, is, is EPA doing anything to reach out um, uh, during the next few months? You had mentioned there was this, this period to, to comment on this clean energy incentive program. So is there anything that EPA is doing to talk to people during this time? And, um, you know, basically how can people, you know, that are interested in these issues get more involved both in the short term and, and you know, throughout the planning process? So I'll, I'll start with maybe uh, Sarah or, or Sarah first and then Lauren can, can follow up on that. Um, I'll, I'll talk about states, but then Lauren, if you want to mention the EPA calls, um, that might make some sense. Sure. Uh, and and <laughs> what I'm going to say is not going to be all that useful to people because the planning process in states varies by state. There is no uniform process. Some states have legislation dictating an administrative process. Others do not, and they're kind of winging it because uh, there are not a lot of rulemakings under this section of the Clean Air Act. and so. They need to kind of figure out who's involved and what their path forward is. I will say lots and lots of states are already having stakeholder engagement meetings. And even if you're in a state that says it's suing, they are probably still also planning. So don't let that be a reason to um, wait. I think it's important to uh, identify who it is you want to talk to and then make an overture to, to get to know them. Great. Thanks, Sarah. Um, in terms of EPA, they are engaged now or, yeah, in the process of doing a series of um, clean energy incentive program stakeholder calls. They held their first call, call on Tuesday, November 10th of this week, and there are um, three more to follow. And they cover everything from a lot of what the, some of the issues we um, touched today in terms of um, defining eligible efficiency measures in low-income communities, defining the definition of what a low-income community is. The next call is on Monday, November 23rd um, at 7 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Instead of going through all the dates of the calls right now, if you reach out to Sarah or I, we'd happily forward you the information for the EPA stakeholder calls. Great. It's, it's also on their website. You should be able to find it on their website if you can't. 
find it, we can find it for you. Thank you. And, uh, and, uh, and another opportunity to get engaged, you know, beyond the, the meetings and everything is just in general that, that um, deadline for submitting comments is January 21st uh, to submit comments on all of these outstanding issues of the Clean Energy Incentive Program and how it looks in um, various state and, and federal plan options. And the uh, EM&D, uh, the Evaluation, Measurement, and Verification Guidance on Efficiency Programs as well. Um, okay, we are going to end here. Uh, we're over time, but as I said, we'll be sure to, to uh, get answers to those questions that we have yet to get to. And we do thank you so much uh, for, to our participants uh, for being so engaged. Um, and certainly thank you to both Sarah and Lauren for the great uh, presentations and follow-up answers to these questions. I think it's pretty clear that this is a, uh, an issue uh, that touches a lot of different stakeholders, and there's a lot of opportunity here um, uh, to get efficiency um, uh, in play uh, uh, in, in the state. So I um, encourage you to follow up with us if you have any other questions. I'll uh, end here with the contact slide again, and thank you all.